the little rocket in the background, by the way. Oh, thank you. That is the Lego Saturn V. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's also a Lego ISS. Hello, everyone. Happy New Year, and thank you for joining us uh, for this online version of ASM Ontario. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight. So my name is Abdallah Al Sayed. for those of you who don't know me, and I'm currently the chair of the ASM Ontario chapter. Like always, I'd like to thank all the chapters from all around Canada, as well as the U.S. for being here today and helping spread the word about these events. I'd also like to thank the University of Guelph for letting me use their WebEx system to facilitate. So we are constantly looking for students who could be kind of our advocates and go-to people at their local institutions. So if you're interested in um, connecting with us and being one of these kind of um, segues from us to your university, please reach out to us. We'd like to hear from you. So now I'd like to pass. Oh, first, if you have any questions for a speaker, please direct them to the question master. He is one of the panelists and he's going to be consolidating all the questions for Jennifer at the end. Now I pass it on to Shane Turcott, who has a few words and will also introduce our speaker today. Hey everyone, it's uh, Shane here at Steel Image. Um, so I wanted to say that when we were planning ASM World Class from the very beginning, it, it was our hopes and dreams that we would find some of the most inspiring metallurgical engineers to speak on some of the hottest topics in the world, to inspire the materials engineers in our industry today, and to interest and attract people who may, who may join us in our industry. And from that perspective, I have to say that I think it's been really, really exciting. Uh, we've had speakers talk from everything from Formula One racing, US military innovation, we even had one of the world's greatest archaeometallurgists talk about the metallurgy of medieval armor. Yet what could be more inspiring or play on the minds of our imaginations than space? The moon, International Space Station, planets, even, even other stars. And, and for that imagination, today's speaker is from NASA. Jen Dominowski is a materials engineer at the NASA Goodert Space Flight Center. Her primary interest is chemical analysis support material challenges, including uh, off-gassing, contamination, bonding issues, and cleanliness. Now, the talk of this, the timing of this talk is perfect tomorrow NASA, NASA's Perseverance rover is expected to land on Mars. Um, Jen, I think you were saying that um, a, a large part of the success of getting the, the Perseverance out there is because of you and your work alone with, with the material selection that you've been doing? Oh my gosh, no, <laughs> I, it's not. But I did get to test something to check out the rover saying that it was okay to launch. So that is pretty cool. But I right. don't not single-handedly responsible for that rover success. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe maybe you were equally modest in the conversation that we had earlier. But there was a <laughs> comment that you told me that someone had said about your group being the and I'm going to get this wrong, it was the the silent wind in the sails of NASA. What was that? What was that expression someone called your group? Yes, somebody told my branch that we were the silent winds that powered their sails to explore the universe. <laughs> I don't think there's anything else I can say to introduce you better. Everyone, here's Jen. All right. Well, hi, everyone. I just want to say thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to talk with you about some of the materials challenges that we face when launching things into space. And then also to talk a little bit about what it is that I get to do as a materials engineer at NASA Goddard. I'm going to try and share my screen now, so bear with me. Yep. Okay, awesome. So, okay, I'm going to provide a very brief introduction on myself, and then I'm going to give an overview of some of the spaceflight projects that NASA currently is doing. I'll talk about the space environment in general, and then how materials fit into that big picture. And then I'm going to talk about some of the spacecraft and environmental testing that we do in order to make sure that everything is go for launch. And then I will talk about organic contamination. So. What is it? Why are we concerned about it? And what kind of tests can we do to make sure that um, we can identify it? So a lot of this information uh, you can find in my bio and was mentioned previously, but I wanted to share a bit more on a personal note. So growing up near Seattle, I always loved going downtown and seeing the Space Needle. 
And this is just one of the many pictures that I've taken of the Space Needle over the years. Uh, but I've always loved looking up at it because it was very inspiring to me. And I also loved looking up at the sky and seeing all the stars and the planets. And I always loved NASA. But I never dreamed that it could be a career possibility for me. I thought that the only way I could ever be involved in NASA was if I became an astronaut. <laughs> But luckily, I discovered material science and engineering when I went to school at Boise State University in Idaho. So I had actually never heard of material science before then. And I didn't really even have a good concept of what engineering was. But thankfully, Boise State has an excellent materials program, and it really helped pave the way for me to get my internships at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center uh, NASA Glenn Research Center, and then of course my career right now as a materials engineer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So I work for the materials engineering branch and I get to do a lot of fun stuff. So these pictures right here are just two things that I really, really enjoyed. This first one here, it shows the first time that I got to suit up in a bunny suit and go work in the clean room. So a bunny suit is something that you wear in order to make sure that whatever flight hardware you're working on stays clean. And honestly, it's not really the most comfortable to wear. It can get really hot once you've been working in the suit for a while. But at least for me, I always feel pretty dang awesome every time I get the chance to wear it. And then this picture here, this is a real moon rock from Apollo 11. And this is probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen. So this moon rock did not specifically go through my labs for work, but I'm still so happy that I had a chance to see it um, when it came to my branch for analysis. All right, so my hope with these next slides is to be able to provide a big picture context when it comes to spaceflight projects, and then also to kind of show where my role as a materials engineer fits in. So NASA has a bunch of spaceflight projects going on right now. You probably recognize some of these, but I just wanna highlight a few of them. So the first one is one of NASA's most iconic missions, and that's the Hubble Space Telescope. That's this first one here. So whenever you see pictures of deep space nebula or other celestial objects, photo credit usually goes to the Hubble. One really fun thing is that the Hubble is actually operated at my center, NASA Goddard. So whenever I go to work, it's pretty cool knowing that the control room for Hubble is just a few buildings away. This next photo is also pretty iconic. This is Pluto from when New Horizons did its flyby back in 2015. My favorite thing about this is that it looks like there's a heart on the planet. That makes me so happy, or the dwarf planet, I guess I should say. <laughs> But New Horizons is the fastest spacecraft ever to launch, and it's currently still traveling with the hopes of exploring more objects in the Kuiper Belt, which is a really icy region of our solar system. So this next one is already mentioned. We have some, the big day is tomorrow, February 18th. I believe it's scheduled to land a little before 4 p.m. Eastern time. So be sure to tune in to watch the landing of the Perseverance rover because that is space history in the making. NASA has sent a lot of different rovers to Mars in the past, which is really cool. Um, but Perseverance's goal is to specifically find signs of life and to collect samples for a possible sample return mission. Another exciting mission is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is, is this one here in the bottom corner. So James Webb is actually scheduled for launch next year, Halloween 2021, and it's often referred to as Hubble's successor. So this space observatory's goal is to detect the first stars and galaxies that were formed in the early universe. OSIRIS-REx is a mission that was recently in the news. So what we did was we sent OSIRIS-REx to Bennu, which is this asteroid right here. It's a near Earth asteroid. In October 2020, we collected some material from it, and now it's on its way back to Earth, and it's scheduled to arrive in 2023. So not only will studying this asteroid material help us answer questions about how our solar system formed, uh, the technology used in this mission is also one of the first steps to things like asteroid mining, which is pretty cool. This next photo over here is a picture of a hurricane in space. Maybe many of you have seen something like this, or maybe you've even tracked the hurricanes or tropical storms yourself uh, while one was happening. So we have the GOES and JPSS satellites to thank for that. 
Even though we cannot control Mother Nature, it's nice to be able to predict what she may do when it comes to these severe weather situations like that. And then finally, we have the SLS or the Space Launch System. So um, NASA is developing this rocket in order to take humans back to the moon and then hopefully to Mars and even beyond. Once it flies, it will be the most powerful rocket ever flown. And it's a part of the Artemis program, which is NASA's next generation missions of lunar exploration. So as you can see, there's a lot of different types of missions and they all have different purposes, very different environments and all unique challenges. So projects like this are very, very complex and they take years of work. And oftentimes the work can span across multiple centers. Um, I always like to share this slide though, because I don't think people always realize just how many NASA centers there actually are. So these are all the different centers that make up our agency. And I've highlighted some of the ones that I've actually interned or worked at. So Glenn Research Center is here in Ohio. Marshall Space Flight Center is here in Alabama, and then Goddard is in this crowded little corner on the East Coast, <laughs> and it's in the state of Maryland near Washington, D.C. I've also included this slide here. So this shows a chart of the NASA project life cycle, and as you can see, it can get really complicated with all the different reviews, uh, checkpoints, and requirements that are needed to pass in order for a mission to fly. But essentially, this life cycle can be broken down into six phases. So phase A is the very beginning. This is where the initial concept and technologies are formed and developed. Phase B is the preliminary design and technology completion phase. So things really start to take form from here. In phase C, everything is finalized and fabricated. In phase D, this is the final stage from a build standpoint. Uh, so everything is put together, tested, and then of course we have launch. Phase E is operations and sustainment of the Spink spacecraft once it's launched. And then phase F is the closeout of the mission. Materials is really involved at every, the work that I do, which is materials lab testing, and it takes place in phase. So before I get more into the specific testing, I just wanted to talk a little bit on the space environment itself. So a lot of the time when you hear space, I feel like you think of like a great beyond or a big mysterious darkness. And don't get me wrong, like space is huge. and It is pretty dark and there's still a lot of mystery to it. There's still a lot of things that we don't quite understand yet or know. But I wanted to at least get everybody on the same page with some of the challenges that we face. A vacuum is defined as a space entirely devoid of matter. So relative to the volume of the universe, there's practically nothing in it. Because space is so empty, the pressure is extremely low and it's unlike any environment that we face on Earth. In addition to that, you have extreme temperatures. So imagine you have a spacecraft that's orbiting around the Earth. Depending on where that spacecraft is in orbit, whether it's being exposed to the sun or it's eclipsed in the shadows, the temperature can go from really hot to really cold really quickly. And that's a lot of stress for a material. Another concern is radiation. And there, that can cause a lot of damage and electronics issues. So there are three main sources of radiation in space. One, radiation come from the sun. Two, there's cosmic background radiation, which is radiation coming from outside of our solar system. And then the third one is radiation that's been trapped in magnetic fields. So while the magnetic fields around Earth, which are known as the Van Allen belts, are magnificent in protecting us from radiation damage, it's something to consider when you have a mission that needs to orbit around or through these magnetic fields. Another concern is space weather. So space weather refers to activity on the sun and this can be solar wind, solar flares, or coronal mass ejections. And this is basically when the sun spits out harmful particles, plasma, and radiation. So as you can imagine, anything getting spit out from the sun causes a lot of damage and electronics failures. So it's something really important that we need to monitor. Another concern, this is a long list of concerns, right? There's a lot of challenges that we're dealing with here. Um, but this one's pretty unique to space. Uh, it's atomic oxygen. So the oxygen that we breathe here on Earth is O2. 
And what happens in space is that ultraviolet radiation will break apart that O2 into a single oxygen atom. And what this means is that oxygen is extremely reactive. So when we launch a spacecraft and we have organic materials on the exterior of that craft, the atomic oxygen will react with it and cause a lot of damage to materials and really a lot of erosion, which is a huge problem. Micrometeoroids and orbital debris is another concern. So micrometeoroids are really, really tiny. They're microscopic particles. But despite their small size, they can punch holes through spacecraft and astronaut suits. And finally, orbits are something to consider. So there are two common orbits for Earth, and they're in this diagram here. We have low Earth orbit, which is LEO, and then geostationary orbit, which is GEO. As you can see, GEO is a much farther distance away from the Earth than LEO is. And depending on where you orbit, your environment will face different challenges. So LEO actually consists of about 96% atomic oxygen, whereas GEO usually faces a harsher thermal environment and there's more radiation concerns as it's not as protected uh, from the magnetic fields that are close to Earth. Usually, communication satellites live in GEO as these satellites remain stationary relative to the Earth's surface. So if you've ever listened to Sirius XM radio, those satellite radios live in GEO. Earth observing satellites typically live in LEO as it's much closer to Earth, so it's easier to observe the Earth. <laughs> and the International Space Station, or the ISS, also resides in LEO. So those are a lot of challenges, right? I mean, honestly, it kind of seems like a miracle that we can even launch anything into space and have it survive. But no matter how complicated the challenge is, material selection can really come back to these foundations of one, what are my material properties? And two, what is the application that I'm trying to use my material for? So I've made a list of some of the more important properties that we evaluate when selecting materials for space. So strength is a big one. Your materials need to be able to withstand any high loads or forces. Weight, uh, we're always trying to minimize weight as much as we can. I talked about the challenges of extreme temperatures and radiation concerns. You need to make sure that your materials can survive that. Um, vacuum stability, so how do your materials behave in a vacuum environment? There's a phenomenon called outgassing, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. But conductivity properties, thermomechanical stability, compatibility with other materials, these are all really important factors to consider. And then you have things like cost, lead times. So can we get this material in time to fit our schedule? And then flight heritage, meaning, you know, have we worked with this material before? Are we familiar with it? Do we know how it's gonna behave when we fly it? While these aren't material properties in themselves, they're very important and do influence selection. So in general, um, all these groups of materials have certain applications that they're used for. So metals are typically used in structural applications. Glass and ceramics are used in optics and high temperature applications. Polymers are used a lot with bonding applications and then composites are used in structural and high temperature applications. So all of these pictures here demonstrate these applications. Um, so for the ISS, uh, which is pictured here, it's that first picture, uh, the common materials used to build it are, let me see, titanium, high grade steel, and aluminum. And this is, cho they were chosen to ensure the structural integrity while also minimizing weight. And then the tiles on the space shuttle are a great example um, for a ceramic thermal protection system. So if you look at the shuttle, you can see the tiles that build up the exterior of it. And these tiles, these ceramic tiles were able to dissipate a lot of the heat upon re-entry and they also provided excellent thermal shock resistance for when the shuttle was coming back to Earth. This picture here with all the really fun colors, um, this was from the MISI projects or the Materials International Space Station experiment. So basically what we did was we took a variety of polymers, we launched them into space, exposed them to that really harsh environment, and then we observed them afterwards to see how did they behave, did they survive, things like that. So this top picture here, this top portion, these are the polymers before they were launched into space. 
And this bottom one here shows what happens after they are exposed to the harsh environment. So if you can see, like compare some of the rows, it's pretty wild seeing the difference just in colors and texture changes, everything. And then finally for composites, this is a picture of the heat shield from the Mars Perseverance rover. And this heat shield is made up of a composite consisting of carbon fiber and cyanate ester prepreg. And composites are a great way to access the best properties of multiple materials. Material selection is extremely important and really without materials, there would be no mission. Uh, for those of you who heard earlier, I, or when Shane introduced me, we talked about how I got that compliment from my branch about uh, materials engineering being the wind and the sails that power uh, ships to explore the universe. And I really, really loved that saying because I honestly think people don't always register the importance of the work that we do as materials engineers. And I think materials are something that are, it's easy to take for granted since we're just surrounded by it all the time. And I just wanna drive home that point again, that just as the sail needs wind to power it, society needs materials engineers in order to turn the ideas that we have for new technologies and missions into a reality. So spacecraft and environmental testing, I am not actually involved in too many of the tests um, that I'm gonna talk about right now, but I wanted to share them because they're really cool and they're pretty unique to spaceflight. All of these facilities can be found at NASA Goddard and other centers, but I know Goddard has all of these because I've seen them. And um, a lot of them were built in order to make sure that flight hardware and spacecraft are able to survive the harsh conditions of rockets, of the rocket launch. And it's really funny to me because I just spent all this time talking about, okay, we need to do this and that to make sure our materials will survive in space, but we have to actually make sure that they can get there first and survive the launch. So I'm not sure how many of you have been able to see a rocket launch in person, but they are really loud, really violent and you can actually feel the rocket launching. And you're standing pretty far away. Like imagine being inside the rocket like these payloads are. So this first one here, the acoustic chest chamber, this, this is like a giant horn and it's about six feet wide or two meters wide. And this is used to blast spacecraft and payloads with the noise levels that would be similar to what they would experience at launch. So the speakers work by using an altering flow of gaseous nitrogen to produce sound levels up to 150 decibels. To give you some context, a normal conversation is about 65 decibels. And hearing loss at sustained exposures happens around a little less than 100. So rocket launches are pretty freaking loud. Like it, it's not even sound at that point because it's so loud. In conjunction with that, the shaker table here this is how we subject the spacecraft to all the super harsh vibrations that it's gonna go through at launch. So what we'll do is we'll attach the payload or the spacecraft to this table, and then we'll shake it in all X, Y, and Z directions. And again, the point of this test is to make sure that everything remains mechanically sound and can endure those harsh vibrations at launch. And this here is a picture of the centrifuge. So. If you've ever seen the movies where they strap the astronauts into this chair and then they fling them around as fast as the machine can go in order to help the astronauts get more familiar with the feeling of increased G's or gravity. This is the same thing, except this centrifuge is used for payloads and spacecraft only. So this here, that is a spacecraft that's attached to the arm. So. Typically, astronauts experience about two to three Gs at launch. Equipment and spacecraft stored in the rocket can experience up to six to seven Gs. And I think this centrifuge, it can actually test up to 30 Gs. So that's a lot of Gs, <laughs> to say the least. And then finally, this last picture on this slide uh, shows the SES chamber at Goddard or the Space Environment Simulator Chamber. The work that I do is actually a little more involved with this, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it on the next slide. All right, so TVAC testing or thermal vacuum testing is how we simulate the environment of space here on Earth. 
And there are many different types of profiles that you can run for a TVAC test, but essentially what you're doing is you're putting the spacecraft um, at vacuum, and then you're cycling between very high and very low temperatures. And so the reason why we're doing this test is you want to determine that everything is still gonna work once it, your instruments get to the space environment. So you wanna make sure that all your electronics are working. You don't have a CTE mismatch or coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch. There's no delamination or separation of your parts. There's no cracking. And then there's no contamination of sensitive components. So this picture here is probably one of my favorite pictures of the James Webb Space Telescope. This shows them loading it into a thermal vacuum chamber at Johnson Space Center for testing. So as you can imagine, these chambers are huge. Like this, that is a person, <laughs> that is a person. So as you can see, relative to the size of that person, this chamber is gigantic. The largest TVAC chamber in the world is actually at NASA Glenn Research Center's Plumbrook Station. And I was really lucky to be able to see it myself. But if you are interested in getting a sense of just how big it is, I highly recommend that you watch the movie, The Avengers. <laughs> because that first scene of the movie is actually filmed inside that vacuum chamber. So organic contamination is a huge concern as it can cause a multitude of different problems. So it can cause in a loss of electronics, it can cause components to delaminate or fall apart, uh, and it can, it can also cause hazing up of important mirrors and optics that would be used for taking images or calibration measurements, things like that. All of these things ultimately lead to the loss of data, which is the whole reason why we're launching spacecraft in the first place. And you may be thinking, so it's dirty, just wipe it off. <laughs> but it's important to keep in mind that while it's easier to do that on Earth, it's not so easy to just wipe off the spacecraft when it's all the way out in space. So organic contamination itself consists of organic compounds. So basically these compounds contain carbon and hydrogen bonds, and they can originate from a lot of different sources. I've listed a few of the more common ones here, and this is where I just wanna point out that organic contamination can be really sneaky. So a lot of the times, uh, you know, it can be from some things that are obvious, but sometimes it can be from the materials that you're using to protect your spacecraft, such as bagging or gloves. And like, this is also a concern in clean rooms, especially. So clean rooms are, have specific low levels of dust and particulate to prevent contamination of sensitive hardware. So even things like paper or cardboard boxes, they would not be allowed in certain clean rooms because they would generate too much fiber or particulate and damage the spacecraft. You even have to be careful about the type of pen that you use. All materials used in clean rooms undergo extensive testing to make sure that they're okay and they're not gonna harm the spacecraft. So the compounds that we're most concerned with uh, tend to be silicones, plasticizers, and hydrocarbon greases, as these compounds will stick to the hardware and they're harder to get off. And keeping things clean is also extremely important for when we're trying to discover life on other planets. So first of all, we don't wanna contaminate other planets with life or things from Earth, right? But we also don't wanna go and have a mission and be like, look, we discovered life. And then it turns out it was a false alarm because you know you brought something from Earth and it accidentally contaminated your instrument. So for that reason, the Perseverance rover has these sample collection tubes that it's going to use to collect samples and those are likely one of the cleanest pieces of hardware that we've ever launched into space. Outgassing, <laughs> we finally get to talk about it. Um, outgassing is a huge concern from an organic contamination standpoint and just in general. So have you ever been in a new car or a room that was just painted and you know how it has a very distinct smell? Well, that's off gassing. So it's when a solid materials will release gas that's trapped inside of it. Outgassing is the same thing, except this occurs when materials are extreme or exposed to extreme vacuum environments. So certain materials may not release any gas while on Earth, but once exposed to space, it will start outgassing. To test for outgassing, 
we follow ASTM standard E595. And so what we do is uh, this test determines the amount of volatile content in a material. And NASA has actually developed a set of outgassing criteria to help provide guidelines on whether or not um, a material should be used in space, whether it passes or fails. And there's actually an entire NASA outgassing database that's available to the public. So we collect this data and store it on there, and then you can access it. Uh, and my branch at NASA Goddard performs nearly all the testing for this database, and we're also the ones responsible for maintaining it. So that's pretty cool. And then here's how the test works. So what we do is we get the sample that we wanna test and we place it in this holder here, and it's completely enclosed except for this small exit port. And then it's attached to this copper bar. So we'll heat the copper bar up to 125 degrees C, and then the material will heat up and any released species will travel through that exit port and it'll condense onto this collector plate right here, which is kept at a cool 25 degrees C. So after that testing is done, we weigh the collector plate to see just how much deposited on there. And then if you wanted to see what species were there, you would send it to my labs to do that chemical analysis. So the type of chemical analysis that I do in my lab usually consists of analyzing non-volatile residue or NVR. And typically the NVR that I analyze consists of organic compounds that remain after evaporation of a liquid. However, NVR can also be transferred to surfaces via dry handling. So this is what I was talking about with the bagging and the gloves. A lot of times bagging and gloves can have slip agents to kind of help everything to not stick together. There can be coatings on it. So all that type of stuff um, can be transferred to your spacecraft just by touching it. So that's a big concern. And the way that um, analysis works in our lab is that we will usually provide a cleanliness level. So a cleanliness level is basically the amount of contamination or NVR per unit area. And these levels are determined via IEST standard CC1246E, very long standard name. Um, but basically we'll provide a cleanliness level and then uh, the project, the contamination engineer on the project will determine whether or not that cleanliness level is acceptable for the mission. So depending on the type of sample, uh, there's many different ways to test for NVR. So you can do a direct solvent rinse of the flight hardware. Um, when I mentioned the collector plate from outgassing, this is one way to do it. We just directly rinse that collector plate and then analyze the NVR. Uh, you can use witness foils and witness plates. So this is a more passive form of collection. This here is a witness plate. And then this is a witness foil. So typically what you do with witness plates and witness foils is you hang them up in clean rooms or whatever space you want to monitor and um, you leave them up for two weeks, a month, however long exposure you want. And you then rinse them afterwards to see what has deposited onto it. So this is a way to monitor the health and cleanliness of a space. Uh, rinses of cold fingers and scavenger plates. If you remember, I mentioned those during TVAC testing. Uh, if you can see in this graph here, this is a typical signature that we get for silicones. And you can see each of the peaks represent different bonds that are in the sample. So normally we're not too happy <laughs> if we see a silicone signature because that means it has silicones contamination. But FTIR is a really nice technique because it's quick, it's easy to run. You only need a small amount of sample and you don't really have to do any sample preparation. So we use it a lot to identify materials. So if we have an unknown contaminant and we don't know what it is, we can identify it using FTIR. Uh, we use it to verify materials to make sure that it is what we think it is. And then we also use it to make sure that materials are clean enough and that there's nothing harmful in them. Gas chromatography mass spectrometry is another technique that we use in our chemical analysis labs. So this is used in tandem with FTIR and NVIR or NVR analysis. And GCMS is a lot more specific. So with an FTIR, you might have a sample and it'll say you have an ester, which is a functional group, right? 
GCMS will be able to tell you, okay, you have dibutyl phthalate. And the way that GCMS works is pretty cool. So let me get my laser pointer. The way it works is you have a carrier gas, which is typically helium, and it pushes your sample through the instrument. So you'll inject your sample here, and then it'll travel through the column. So a column is basically a really thin capillary tube. And as your sample travels through the column, it'll separate out based on boiling point and then affinity to the stationary phase that's inside the column. So as they separate out into the individual components, they'll reach the detector or the mass spectrometer at different times. So when they reach the MS, they will ionize and then they'll be separated based on mass. So then what you end up with is a chromatogram where here each of the individual peaks are uh, individual compounds. And then you have a mass spectrum that's paired with the peak. And this acts as a unique fingerprint ID of the compound. So that's how we use GCMS and it's very helpful in our analysis. Thermal desorption is a sample introduction technique for the GCMS. So this is mainly used to collect volatile and semi-volatile organics. And a lot of what we use this for is with purge gases. So purge gases are typically used for keeping flight hardware clean and dry. Um, and this is especially important when you're working with lasers or optics, things that are very sensitive. So we use this technique to make sure that our purge gases are clean and we're not introducing any unwanted contaminants to our hardware. So the way this works is we have our sample tube. So this is a typical sample tube that would be used for this. And it's filled with an absorbent material, which is a porous polymer resin. So we'll flow the gas through the tube. And as the gas flows through, any uh, volatiles or semi-volatile organics will be collected and trapped in those pores. And then it'll stay there until it's exposed to some type of heat. So what we do is once we collect our sample, we take this tube and put it in our GCMS instrument where we heat it up. And as the sample heats up, it will release everything that it's trapped into the GC column where it will separate out as I described earlier. So this picture over here is just a real life example of me sampling something. So this was a spray gun that we, I was testing the spray gun was going to be used to clean and dry printed circuit boards for a project. So by collecting the gas flowing through the spray gun, I was able to confirm the cleanliness of the purge gas itself, the delivery lines used for the purge gas, and then the components in the gun themselves. So as I mentioned before, organic contamination, <laughs> it's sneaky. For me, it's like I would never stop to think that the equipment that I'm using to clean and protect my equipment is actually what's causing the problem. So that's why you always got to be on your toes and it can always come from the most unexpected sources. One of my favorite thermal desorption projects that I got to be a part of was actually a collaboration between a coatings engineer at NASA Goddard and then the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History, which is awesome because I just love the Smithsonian uh, so the coatings engineer, her name is Nithin Abraham, and she developed MAC, which is the molecular adsorber coating. And this technology is originally developed for spaceflight to help minimize outgassing contamination in space. However, this specific project was trying to determine MAC's effectiveness with applications here on Earth. So the museum support center at the Smithsonian uh, which is where artifacts are stored when they're not on display, was having some mercury off-gassing contamination issues. And this mercury was coming from mineral ores um, that just contained mercury themselves, but they were also coming from botany specimens that were preserved with mercuric chloride salts. So what we did was we installed MAC in these cabinets to see how well it would collect the contaminants. So these little white squares here, those are all samples of the MAC coating. And that's me <laughs> wearing a respirator because, you know, mercury is dangerous. Um, but yeah, this is just a great example of how technologies developed for space can be used for applications here on Earth. And honestly, I love it when that happens. It's my favorite thing. And the official name for those technologies are known as spinoffs. 
So NASA spinoffs are technologies, products, and processes that were developed using NASA technology, funding, and or expertise, and are now available as commercial products that benefit everyday life. So I just have a few of some of the ones that I really loved. This first one here is the is a swimsuit. It was the Speedo laser swimsuit, and it was worn by Olympic swimmers. I actually used to wear one when I competed in swimming, so I especially love this one. This swimsuit um, was designed utilizing the wind tunnels at NASA Langley, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> this here is memory foam. So we see it a lot in our beds and our pillows now, but it was originally developed as a way to help NASA test pilots be more comfortable on long test flights. Baby formula, uh, this started as an effort to figure out a way to feed astronauts on the International Space Station. So providing food that was still nutritious, even though, you know, it's not like they can cook regularly like we do here on Earth. So the technology developed trying to answer that challenge eventually provided a way for us to produce nutritious baby food. Firefighting uniforms, so the fabric that they use in fire shelters, those all have origins in space explorations. One of my projects at Glenn Research Center actually was involved with working with composite materials that were aimed to be a thermal protection blanket for spacecraft um, as it re-enters, but it was also doubling as a way to serve as fire shelters for wildland firefighters. Agriculture has also benefited from NASA spinoffs. We now use satellite data to get um, data on farming and crop predictions. So that's been huge with helping, you know, food efficiency and making sure what should we plant, what should we grow and where should we do it. And then finally, even the coating on your sunglasses, that was a NASA spinoff, which was originally developed to help astronauts because, you know, when you're in space, UV radiation, things are bright. Um, the coating developed with the astronaut helmets eventually trickled down to our sunglasses, which I know I am very grateful for. So it's really exciting seeing some of the ways that space exploration has affected our immediate world here on Earth. All right, so with that, I just want to end my talk with a few conclusions. First of all, selecting the right materials to use for spaceflight missions is very, very complicated. So I know I covered quite a bit of information, but I hope at least one major takeaway is that space is an extreme environment with a great number of challenges. But we also have an extensive number of tests that we can do in order to prove that our materials and spacecraft will rise up to that challenge. Secondly, uh, the work that we do in space exploration results in a lot of new materials, new technologies, and new solutions to age old problems. I think people tend to think that space is very separated or distant from their everyday lives. Although it does seem like it, the work that we do actually hits so much closer to home that you realize. And finally, I hope that as you go through life, you can take a look up at the stars and then you can take a look at the immediate world around you and see that there is a connection and there are so many more exciting things yet to come. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed and learned something that you didn't know before. And I also want to thank the Ontario chapter of ASM International for even giving me this opportunity to speak with you all. So here's to hoping I can answer your questions. <laughs> Alrighty, thank you so much, Jen. Um, to, I, I don't know where to start. Um, maybe uh, like the Mars Perseverance, I think it's safe to say this presentation was out of this world. <laughs> that, that's probably a good starting point. Uh, thank you so much for putting this wonderful presentation together. Uh, so for all our attendees, uh, please, if you have a question, please submit them uh, via the chat to the question master, specifically to the question master, as we'll be filtering through the questions there and then sending them uh, to Jen as they come in uh, for as long as we can. Uh, so while you're writing out your questions, so please do that now. Uh, we first, um, happy new year, everybody. Uh, this is our first talk of 2021 and uh, we did it with a bang. Um, uh, <laughs> So thank you very much for coming. Um, our next talk, it will be coming on the evening of Wednesday, March 10th, and we'll be talking with John Twiley, who is an art conservationist. Uh, so we're bringing things back down to earth. 
um, wh where he goes into some ancient metals uh, that originated in Asia, and he's going to dive into microstructures and microchemical analysis, microchemical analyses uh, that were went into decoding uh, some of this ancient um, metallurgical methods that they used. And um, my favorite part, because we got to hear uh, little tidbits of it, um, is after his presentation, he's got some bonus content where he dives into some of his work he's done in ancient concretes and uh, a superhero suit. So normally I make a superhero joke. Didn't have to. Uh, he's actually going to be addressing something like that, which is pretty great. Uh, so again, that is uh, the evening of Wednesday, March 10th. Um, and if you enjoy talks like Jen's, um, and you want more, uh, whether it's this week, next week, uh, I highly recommend that you check out our ASM Connect site. Uh, so generally on your right-hand side, it'll tell you other events that are going on with other chapters around uh, Canada, America, or India, and they're going all the time. So there's ones this week coming up on Celtic jewelry and just super alloy. So there's really a wide range. So use your ASM or materials advantage membership uh, to your advantage uh, if you're looking for more content or just wanna you know, become a smarter person. Um, so again, thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for the amazing talk. Um, I'm gonna start typing out my question now and uh, I'm gonna pass things back over to Abdallah. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Awesome shirt, by the way. Uh, Jennifer, thanks for the talk. Uh, we really learned a lot, and I think our members really enjoyed it. I um, want to give a big thanks. <laughs> Thank thanks you for so having much. us. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone who attended. I hope you enjoyed the talk as much as we did. We hope to see you at the next one. Think anything else, Shane or Jordan, that I'm missing? That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, everyone. to say, but it was just amazing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you Thank you so you. much. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jen. All right. Thanks. Bye, Jen.